All right. So with that, it is now 532. Um, so we'll go ahead and start with today's session. Um, APA is very, very excited to be having Miss Nikki in here with us today. She is all the way from Singapore and she is uh, practicing as a pharmacist there and she'll be sharing with us today about the COVID-19 vaccines um, as well as kind of sharing her perspective um, being from Singapore. So with that, I will just go ahead and let Nikki take it away. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to hold them till the end. I'm sure she'll be happy to answer them. Hello, hi. It's morning for me now. <laughs> so today, uh, really uh, excited to share something with you about the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, mainly from, I guess, from Asia's perspective. Um, and I uh, wanted to maybe share a bit about what kind of uh, vaccines we have and what about our roles as pharmacists? Are we ready uh, for the vaccine? Okay, so maybe a little bit about myself. I'm a pharmacist. I uh, studied in Australia before and then was practicing there for a while, then moved to Singapore, was here in, uh, I did uh, about four, four years in the hospital here and did experience the H1N1 um, pandemic that time. And then later on, I moved on to be an editor um, in a medical publishing company. Okay. So, let's see. Get this moving. Okay, so disclaimer, as usual, um, I do not have any financial interest or relationship to disclose. Um, also want to point out that whatever that is uh, shared today, I hope it is as up-to-date as possible. But because COVID-19 is evolving very, very quickly. So please always refer to the latest information available, okay? So what I'll be going through is really just some overview and uh, talk a little bit about the COVID-19 vaccines and what are the different types of the vaccines out there, okay? What are the differences mainly? Um, we also touch a little bit about the passive immunization. Um, what our roles can be as pharmacists and wrap it up with some Southeast Asia updates. Okay, um, this is as of 1st of December. Uh, COVID has already you know, infected more than 62 million uh, people and claimed more than 1.4 uh, life, million lives. That's really serious. So is COVID-19 the magic bullet in this case? We need to understand first what does COVID-19 vaccine meant to do. So it is an active immunization to stimulate our body own immune system to produce the antibody, firstly to neutralize the uh, virus, also to then um, have the cell-mediated immunity. So that's the long-term memory um, to protect us from the virus again. Why do we want to do that? because there are historical success against other bacteria and viruses. Um, so with any vaccines, um, there'll be two things that is always being mentioned a lot, like the humoral um, immunity with the antibody production and the T cell uh, responses, also known as the uh, cellular immunity, which is kind of like the long-term memory um, for our immune system. Um, what's important with any vaccine is always safety and efficacy. And to do that, uh, there are a few things we need to consider. Um, fundamentally, a vaccine needs one thing, uh, two things. One is the antigen from a target pathogen. So in this case, it will be the COVID-19 virus. Okay. And it also needs to have an infection signal so that the, our immune systems will get alerted and then trigger the whole of the uh, immune responses. Okay. For the design, there are quite a few things to consider. Um, firstly, we need to look, make sure that the uh, antigens or antigen um, needs to be of the correct combination. Okay. Choice of the platform is also important because there are certain advantages um, for certain platforms, which we'll discuss shortly. Um, we also need to know how the vaccines are being administered. I mean, traditional is, traditionally, it's through IM, but there could be other routes of administration as well. Okay. What about the regimen itself? 
studies have uh, shown that if it's a multi-dose vaccine, the compliance tends to wane and it may not be as effective. So this is a um, picture of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, for majority of the vaccines that are in clinical trials anyway, um, they are targeting a few areas. The first one is the uh, S protein or the spike protein. This is where the um, virus will attach to the ACE receptor and then cause an infection. So that's why uh, it's being targeted. Um, within the S protein, there are S1 and S2 subunits. Um, another section that is really being targeted is what is known as a receptor binding domain. This is uh, sitting in the S1 surface. Uh, ultimately, I would say, just to point out that these are the main areas um, targeting on entrance of the uh, virus to infect our cells. Okay. When we talk about vaccines, there's always a few things that are being uh, asked as well. Um, this is more from a safety perspective as well. Um, there's a term known as antibody-dependent enhancement. And uh, it's a phenomenon or an observation. Sometimes the antibody uh, generated or induced by the vaccine actually make the infection worse. Um, this happened and became a big issue about two years ago with the dengue vaccines. Um, it was observed that the... Uh, the children who were vaccinated actually had a more severe dengue um, after being vaccinated. Uh, there are quite a few mechanisms um, due to macrophages and also complement interplay. Uh, however, we are not sure at this moment whether the COVID-19 actually will have this um, phenomenon. So this is still a question. Um, I would say the most of the vaccine developers are aware of this um, because it has been in the report. Um, this can be circumvented usually by choosing the right antigens and the doses. So is it not too much, not too little kind of thing? Okay. When uh, another thing when we talk about vaccines, uh, there's always this word adjuvant. So some vaccine platforms. It, um, is unable to um, trigger T cell re response as uh, a very good T cell response. So the adjuvants are really added to help that. The most common ones is the aluminium hydroxide, also known as alum. Okay, but there are also newer types such as the uh, ASO4, ASO3, and etc. Okay, you see some of these being used in the vaccine candidates. Um, this one is just to highlight, usually with any vaccine development or drug development, you have the preclinical studies all the way to phase four. Uh, what's interesting with the COVID-19 vaccine development this time around, a lot of these phases were being collapsed or being done simultaneously. Traditionally, everything has to be done in, you know, sequential. So you get all the phase one data analyzed and uh, before you move on to the phase two, uh, analyze again, um, get approval from the community before you keep moving on. Um, because of the time, uh, we say facing against the time. So I saw a lot of like phase one and two are being done together, two and three are conducting at the same time. And uh, I also want to caution, there's a lot of um, um, preprint data that's being published a lot. Um, not to say that they are not good, or just have to be cautious when we uh, interpret the data, okay? Because it had probably hasn't been analyzed or, or peer reviewed. Okay, so this is taken from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, <clears throat> looking at um, the landscape of the vaccine development. Uh, there are more than 260 vaccine candidates um, at various stages. Um, more than 60 of them are in human trials now. Okay, uh, you can see majority of them are using this um, technology called protein subunit. Okay, and uh, 
the other one that are probably more exciting, we'll touch more on is the inactivated uh, RNA and the rep non-replicating viral vector, because these are the ones already in phase three, okay, which means they are closer to success. Okay, what should be an ideal COVID-19 vaccine looks like? Ideally, it should be thermal stable and in a solid form. Why so? This is uh, talking more from the logistic point of view. How do we want to distribute the vaccine around? Uh, although we know traditionally they are requiring cold chain they're in liquid form, so like glass valves and everything. Um, non parenteral vaccine would be also ideal. So there are certain um, uh, candidates are using the non um, injection route. So we can have a look at some of them later on. Okay, so I'm going to go through some of the uh, vaccine platforms. I will hi try to highlight what are the um, advantages, challenges, and uh, then we we'll look at some of the examples as well. Um, I will go through this more from uh, evolution point of view of the vaccine technology. Okay. So the first one probably is the live attenuated vaccine. Okay, very old decade, right? What it does is it really weakens the um, live pathogens and it will then induce a mild infection. So the immune response from this type of vaccines are generally very um, strong. So it can also long lasting. Okay. Um, some of the successful ones include the BCGs, the measles, rubella, influenza, yellow fever. Okay. Uh, definitely very well established uh, type of uh, platform. Okay. But it also has a downside, including because um, it is a live virus after all, um, it can trigger the infection itself, especially for the in immunocompromised, the very young. Okay. Um, then something better than this will be the inactivated. So this is like a killed or you know a purified uh, pathogen itself. Okay. Um, the problem with this is it could have a weaker immune response, typically on the T uh, cell response. Um, therefore, uh, most of the inactivated vaccines will have an adjuvant. Okay. Or they might need multiple doses. Okay, some of the successful ones are include polio, Hep A, um, influenza as well. Okay, and it's definitely a very established uh, vaccine platform. Um, if you say talking about manufacturing process, it's also quite established. So what are the examples out there now? So some of them are already in the news, I'm pretty sure. So Sinovac, um, Sinopharm has two candidates over here. Um, if you look at them, they are usually all grown in viral cells and inactivated by this uh, beta propion lactic, and they're all alone uh, adjuvant. Um, all of them are using IM. Um, there's slight differences in dosages, um, probably because of the uh, virus that they, the strains that they were using. Okay. Um, so some of them have uh, published data already. So for the Sinovac ones, uh, yeah, so this one has a phase two trial data published uh, up to 59 years old and seems to be quite promising. Okay, um, Most of them also shown relatively good uh, ADR profile, mainly just the injections like um, pain, fever, uh, yeah, not too serious. Um, one thing I did note was there were still quite a lot of uncertainty about how about the T cells response. Because if uh, the T cells response is not clear, we wouldn't know how long the uh, immunity or the protection could last from the vaccine. Okay. Um, for this one, they actually also had data that is uh, ready for the elderly, okay, so greater than 60 years old. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they're doing. Um, as far as I know, these are already in, uh, uh, approved as emergency use in China. Okay, moving on, looking at something new. Uh, so they 
Just now we're looking at you're using whole uh, pathogen. What about can we use part of it? Yes. So the protein subunit vaccine, which is using only a partial of the pathogen. Okay. So it's meant to be um, also relatively good in triggering antibodies, so the your humoral as well as cellular uh, immunity. Because it's only partial of the pathogen, so it's non-infectious. Okay. Um, similarly to this is a virus-like particle or VLP vaccines. So what's the difference between these two? So this one is looking at some components like the S protein, for example. For this one, you're looking at the shell of the uh, pathogen. Okay, so imagine you're only having the, the round circle of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. Okay, um, because it's only the shell, it doesn't have the uh, genetic material, so it can't replicate. Therefore, again, it is like non-infectious. Right, so these are also fairly established um, platforms. Um, you can see there are certain like HPV is also at one of the examples already. Okay, um, again, these two because being just a like partial of the pathogen, they may either require adjuvant or require multiple dosages. So let's look at some examples. The one that is probably more uh, advanced in terms of the research uh, would have been the Novavax uh, candidate. This is taking the full length of the spike protein, so the S protein that we talked about, and is using adjuvant uh, known as matrix M1. Okay, so it's already in phase two and three trials in some of the countries. Uh, phase one data has shown more than 96% of uh, S protein neutralizing antibodies. So this is talking about uh, the vaccine is able to trigger uh, neutralizing antibody production. Okay. Um, the other thing to note during when you read about vaccine studies, um, remember we also need to know whether the response to T cells is present. Uh, so some of the studies will be uh, reporting uh, this. Okay. Um, these are other ones that are available. Uh, I don't have any updates yet because we they either haven't published it or still in very early stage of the trial. Okay. Uh, the protein subunit vaccine, which is also where majority of the candidates are. So and have a look at them. So this one is targeting the RBD region, okay, and is using a tobacco-based uh, kind of process. Okay, um, these are the ones. Uh, CSL is also uh, doing one. Uh, most of them are still in preclinical data. I haven't seen much being published. Um, so you can see these are using different types of adjuvant. Okay. For the virus-like particle, um, the one that has moved a little bit more uh, faster is this one by Medicago. Uh, it is looking at the, being produced in the tobacco um, using the ASO2 adjuvant. Um, the uh, pre-press uh, data have shown good uh, humoral response as well as cellular response. Okay. And it seems like the, the one adjuvant with the ASO3 has a better or more promising results. Okay. Um, something newer will be using a uh, vector. Okay. So what happens is either you take some of the antigenic genes from the pathogen, you clone it into, you can think of it like a vehicle, right? Either you choose a non-replicating virus to deliver the um, genetic material or use a replicating um, vector. So the non-replicating, some of the examples include adenovirus or lentivirus. For the replicating one, um, it could be a meso-based or influenza-based. Okay, so these ones, uh, one of the biggest advantages is it can be quite fast to generate. When I say 
fast to generate. You can produce this practically in the lab, uh, but that doesn't translate uh, always to what about mass production in factory. That, that's quite a different uh, standard, I would say. Okay. For studies and things like that, it's pretty fast to can then um, study the different efficacy as well. Okay. The problem with this type of uh, virus uh, vector vaccines is the pre-existing uh, anti-vector immunity. Because the choice of this uh, virus vector, um, if it's something that is too common, it, that has already you know, spread around in the population, the, generally the population would have certain immunity against that virus. And then it will then make the uh, vaccine less uh, effective. Okay, so that's something um, pretty concerning. But we'll see later on. We can look at some examples how they circumvent this. Okay. Um, yeah. So the replicating one because uh, it is replicating. Okay. So it's generally not for the immunocompromised. I'm pretty sure this one is no stranger. So the AstraZeneca version, um, together with the Oxford Uni, it's uh, using this technology. Um, it is using a spike protein, and they have chosen the chimpanzee adenovirus. Um, the choice is based on their past experience uh, looking with, I think, I forgot which virus they were looking against. Uh, was it Zika or something else? So um, they did. Did some see some uh, good response, so they have chosen the chimpanzee uh, adenovirus instead of the human adenovirus. Okay, um, so it is an IM dose. Um, at that point in time, it was either a one or two doses. You know, being phase two trials is looking at various type of dosages and uh, regimens. Okay, um, they have data all the way to greater than seventy years old. Uh, interestingly, um, comparing to the rest of the vaccine trial, this one actually was comparing not again, not against a placebo, but against another um, vaccine. They have chosen, I think it was the meningococcal vaccine, because they want to mimic the type of uh, same uh, systemic ADR kind of things you would expect from a vaccine. So for this, um, the serial conversion it was ob observed is about more than ninety percent, uh, and then close to a hundred percent for two doses. And uh, T cells uh, was also observed, uh, very mild ADR, uh, fever, chills, okay, and uh, mainly in the two doses uh, group. So the ongoing trials are still looking at you know which is the most optimal. Uh, those for different population, for example. Okay. Um, CanSino also has uh, one version. This is using an adenovirus 5. Uh, this one with the phase 2 data has shown about 50 to 60% um, seroconversion and T cell responses detected. However, there is also um, concern that the reduced um, Efficacy could be due to existing immunity against the adenovirus 5. This is pretty common uh, as a respiratory virus. So Jensen also has another version also using this technology. Um, they have chosen the adenovirus 26 instead. Okay. Um, Pre-press uh, data has shown good results. Okay. Um, it's also noted the uh, adenovirus 26 could be less immunogenic than 85, so you may need either booster doses. Okay, Gamalaya research or the vaccine also known as Sputnik 5. Okay, um, I think it's a pretty ingenious way of uh, developing the vaccine itself. So it's still using spike protein, but instead of using either uh, deciding between adenovirus 5 or 26, so they say, why not we use both? Okay, so for them, they're using, uh, for the first dose, the priming, they use the 26, which is the less uh, immunogenic, 
and then for the booster dose, they use the uh, adenovirus 5. Okay. Um, the published data seems to point to very good results, but remember these are phase 1, 2 trials, so there are limited uh, subjects. Um, there are two formulations that they were making. One is the uh, lyophilized, so it's a solid form. And they were also looking at frozen form as well for, I guess, for their country, it would be good for transportation. Okay, so for the replicating ones, um, one of it is using a meso as the virus vector. Another one is using a uh, influenza as a vector. Um, I just wanted to share that for this one, remember we talked about most of them being IM. So this one is trying to do the intranasal route. Um, I don't have any updates about them. Hopefully they're doing fine. Okay, probably the last ones is on the RNA and DNA vaccines. Okay, these are probably uh, some of the hottest ones out there now. These are very new um, vaccine platform. Um, in fact, there are currently no commercial vaccines uh, using this vaccine platform yet. Um, that's why uh, probably need a little bit more um, study. Um, the DNA vaccine will have the uh, antigenic material encoded into a DNA, and then hopefully this thing gets into our cell nucleus so that it can um, express the viral antigens so that we can trigger an uh, infection. So the only difference is the uh, RNA ones is using the RNA materials. Okay, so this one is a little bit bigger. And so because the DNA being size-wise a little bit bigger, um, the delivery method um, sometimes needs certain different, um, so our traditional um, IM injection. Okay, we take a look at that shortly. Um, they are all non-infectious because it's really just the uh, DNA materials that are being uh, administered. Uh, yep, I think, okay, with the RNA, right, just to point out also, because the stability is pretty bad, um, so generally you need certain unique carriers, including the lipid nanoparticles or liposomes to help it. Um, and the formulation tends to require really, really cold kind of cold chain. So for the DNA ones, uh, this one by the Innovio, they need something called electroporation device that kind of sends an electric pulse to open up the um, cell membrane so that the DNA can actually enter to the cells. So quite cool, I guess. Um, but I'm not so sure about acceptance on, on that one. Um, Osaka also has something similar, and uh, Genesin also has a biojector device so that it can actually um, deliver the vaccine to where it should be. Okay, the RNA ones. Uh, a few, these are the two probably the hottest and perhaps the most advanced in terms of the uh, data that we have. The Moderna version is mRNA 1273. It is basically a S protein um, expressing the mRNA. Uh, it's encapsulated with uh, lipid nanoparticles. Okay, it's already, I think, close to completion of that phase three trials and uh, already submitted to various countries for emergency use authorizations. Um, the doses that I can gather, it seems to be like 100 microgram in 0 0.5 mil, uh, given as I am two doses, 28 days apart. Okay. So for phase one data that they have shown 100% and T cells, um, what they did with their phase one data, they were also recruited uh, elderly. So for them, they also shown good immune response at 100 uh, microgram. The uh, ADRs are generally uh, mild and uh, it's more frequent at the higher and subsequent doses. Um, 
I do want to point out the published data, I could only get both the phase one data. I don't know when they're phase two and three, they haven't really uh, published probably because they're still doing um, error analysis as well. For the BioNTech and Pfizer version, they started off with uh, four different uh, versions. Okay, but as the data progress, uh, they seems to narrow down to only two. I think ultimately they will likely be using the this version, the B two. Okay, so it will be the spike protein mRNA with the lipid nanoparticle. Okay, and uh, I think the latest was the UK has just approved for a uh, emergency use, and so less than twenty four hours ago. Uh, for them, they're using at that 30 microgram in uh, 0 0.5 mil. Uh, again, I haven't seen any actual published uh, phase 2 and 3 data. Uh, but what I can see is, you know, see neutralizing antibodies are good. And the uh, booster dose seems to even make the efficacy better. Okay. Um, although elderly seems to be a bit milder in terms of the response okay um, side effect wise seems to be really good as well okay um something closer to home for me um duke nus uh, they had one version um still undergoing recruitment at the moment um, imperial college of london also have another version they were using this, this self-amplifying rna so slightly different uh curevac here has a version that is a little bit in uh, their really published uh, pre-press data so it has shown zero conversion up to 80 percent and uh, bound uh, adr Okay, so th that was looking at different type of uh, vaccines. Now, remember, vaccines are active immunization process. Okay, so what about those uh, that cannot have a vaccine? Okay, due to various reasons. Um, I think immunocompromised, the very young, the very old, essentially the very vulnerable group. There is another strategy that we probably can consider known as passive immunization. And this is using like antibody. Okay, so the antibody can be from the infected models. Um, it could be pooled human plasma from uh, those uh, patients who have recovered, or it could be a rec recombinant version. Okay, because basically we're just injecting or administering exogenous uh, antibody to really neutralize the virus itself. Um, advantages is really its immediate effect or should be okay um, it could be something to consider for those who uh, maybe fail to mount any uh, immunity after vaccination okay do we have any successful ones yes uh, cmv ivig um, herpes simplex virus ivig these are some of the things that are really been um, in the market and use monoclonal wise um there is uh this one for rsv okay um some of these advantages is it's still i guess it's in theory and i guess the most important thing is we don't know how long this passive immunization the protection can last okay um hopefully with the uh, active immunization you know with the t-cells response we are hoping it can last for years to come, right? Um, for passive immunization, generally it doesn't last that long, okay, even from experiences with um, CMV and the rest, okay. All right, so after looking at so many vaccines, like, oh, yeah, so many um, candidates, like, I guess there's still certain things we need to think about. Firstly, like, how much safety data is necessary? Do we need to do a trial that's continuing to millions? Or is 50,000 and the subject is adequate? Um, I think those are some of the things we may need to think about. Um, are the trials also looking into vulnerable groups? Um, elderly, the ones with chronic diseases, a lot of them has 
at least for the elderly ones, some of them are included, you can see just now. But what about those with chronic diseases? A lot of them have been excluded from the trial. And we haven't seen any data in children, okay? Um, although COVID-19 seems to have less impact on the kids, but doesn't mean we, we shouldn't uh, include them in the vaccination, okay? Um, something also to take note is if these vaccines are they protecting against only the SARS-CoV-2 or what about other coronaviruses? You know, looking back at history, we saw the first SARS was 2003, then we have 2010 MERS from the coronavirus family, and now this one, uh, COVID-19. Uh, there could be other coronaviruses out there as well. Um, so what about mutations as well? You know, the, with any viruses, there's always mutations. Okay? And uh, this is also a good question to ask how much of the populations that we need to vaccinate to achieve a good or desired immunity. Okay. Um, I can't answer you that, but there seems to be some magic number, about 70%, okay? Uh, and because we are racing against time, so I think it's always a rolling um, thing that uh, the regulators uh, they need to work very closely with the vaccine developers to make sure they get the latest data. Uh, if there is any um, serious ADR that are being detected, they get it firsthand okay, so that they know they are approving a safe and effective vaccine. Okay. I guess the next thing we also need to look at, oh, how are we going to facilitate the vaccination exercise? Okay. Having the vaccine is only the first step. Okay, getting the vaccine out there, actually administering it is probably the most crucial part. Okay, knowing that there'll be a limited number of vaccines to begin with, so who are the ones who get vaccinated first? Okay, the vulnerable groups or the frontline worker? Okay, um, as I mentioned, there will there are certain vaccines that are requiring cold chain or sub-zero fridges as well. So do we have enough uh, logistics support? Okay, so ultimately we need to ask ourselves, are we ready for the COVID-19 vaccination? So after, I guess, close to a year waiting for a vaccine, we are nearly there. So are we ready? So, Probably some of the questions we need to think through um, to see that. Okay, I want to also explore a little bit about what is our role as a pharmacist, okay? What can we do? Okay. Ultimately, um, as with any medications, first thing first is still medication safety. We want to make sure we're going to um, dispense the correct vaccine, we'll make sure the vaccines are being administered correctly, we'll make sure these uh, vaccines are stored correctly. Okay, so medication safety is still very good. But how do we do that? I guess one of the things is also on education. Now the education is not just about educating patients on whether they should get vaccine, that's, that's important, but also educating ourselves so that we keep up to date and knowing um, the most recent development and uh, what they perhaps uh, ADR we need to be concerned about. Okay, so this is uh, two way things educating ourselves and also educating our patient. Um, a large function of pharmacy's uh, role is also about access to the vaccines. Um, once it gets approved, uh, how do we make sure it's stopped in the pharmacy? stop in the hospital, how do we um, you know, have enough logistics uh, to actually get all of it. Um, that's probably on a more uh, personal level as a pharmacist. On a higher level, national level wise, um, certain initiatives by the WHO has COVAX program, trying to make sure each country could get at least 20% of the population uh, vaccinated. So that's looking at equitable uh, distribution of the vaccines. We don't want to see like any countries like buying up all the vaccines. Okay. 
Um, another part is looking at regulatory. Um, pharmacists, a lot of them also work in the regulatory industry, okay? Um, both uh, helping us to approve and assess the uh, vaccines to be used, okay? But for uh, us in the dispensing or the clinical um, side of things, we could also help by making sure we feedback to the regulators if we observe any ADR, okay? So because they will aggregate all the data to make sure, you know, medication safety. Because if any one of the patients had observed any serious ADR, uh, it should be notified to the regulators uh, or to other healthcare professionals to uh, pay attention. Okay. The actual vaccinations, like some, I know some countries and uh, pharmacists also play an important role in the actual vaccinations. So, you know, getting trained to do the, uh, participate in the uh, program will be very interesting. Um, I must say though, uh, Asia still lags behind in this area. Um, most countries, the pharmacists are still not trained or not tapped into to do the vaccination. Uh, hopefully there'll be certain improvement towards that. Okay. Um, as with any, uh, pandemic or any disaster, there's always opportunity as well. So. What I wanted to highlight is uh, another place we can perhaps think about is helping out in research. When we talk about research, why? Because we need to make sure we are doing evidence-based practice, meaning we do need to collect a whole bunch of data so that we can analyze to improve and also be more prepared for perhaps the next pandemic. Okay, So in terms of the research, I think COVID-19 is also where we saw a lot of uh, um, I'm pretty sure if those of you pay attention to te technology side of things, like big data analysis, um, that kind of thing. So that's also one area to look into. Um, what about success of uh, you know um, the vaccination program? Those are also the areas that could help uh, us understand. And in fact, perhaps next time we can roll out any vaccin vaccination program much more effectively and efficiently. Okay, so probably about the last things to talk about what's happening in Southeast Asia. Okay, so for Southeast Asia, um, I guess if you can look at this, this is as recent as last night. Um, some countries are doing better than others, but there's also still spikes. Like these countries are still having close to four digits per day. Um, and with any countries, uh, these kind of spikes, uh, of course, we have to look at how many tests were done as well. Okay, uh, Indonesia is a very big country. Uh, I think with more than one billion populations. Uh, I'm actually quite concerned about Malaysia being very close to Singapore, and you can see these spikes of like uh, four digits for a few, maybe a two weeks before now. They have been doing very good for uh, a few months, and then you see this big spike. Uh, in the, uh, Singapore being a super small city state, but uh, the total number of cases is quite significant. Um, Singapore has a population of about 5.5 million. Okay. Um, you can see the number of tests is close to everyone, uh, but that's uh, not true. <laughs> I think it's because. Um, Singapore's case is a little bit different. The cluster, the biggest clusters were actually in the migrant workers' dorm. And when it was first discovered, I think in April, um, the government had taken the initiative to surveillance, uh, really screen everyone in the dorm. So that's why you see a huge spike. Um, but in a way, I guess it's good uh, because uh, you can kind of make sure or prevent there is any more uh, active cases of uh, looking around and, and walking around the streets. And uh, so that's what they did. Um, yeah, um, 
please feel free to ask me later on if you want me to elaborate more about any countries that you're interested in. Um, certain countries I may not know, but I'll try my best to answer. Okay, so this is not just a different uh, graphic uh, kind of looking. This is by WHO's data. Um, this is a smooth curve, so you can see this spike. And this is Singapore, and it's due to the dorm uh, migrant workers that they were screening. Okay, so if any country decided or any place decided to really screen massively, I would expect this kind of spikes as well. Okay, uh, but I think it's a slightly different story. You see a spike here. Um, I understand the situation is because they have suddenly ramped up the. Uh, testing facilities as well and capabilities and because of that uh, the, they were able to process more tests and I heard there was like a backlog of a thousand cases and therefore when the data were released and we suddenly see a huge spike. Okay, all right that's the end and I'm open to any questions and I hope this is going to be a discussion session. Yeah. Thank you so, so much, um, Nikki, for the amazing presentation. Uh, I'm sure like everyone learned a lot. I learned a lot. Um, but yeah, from now, we just have time for questions. If anyone wants to ask, uh, whether it's about the vaccines, whether it's about like, like Nikki said, like a country that you're interested in, like learning more about, mm. um, feel free to drop that in the chat um, and I will read it for her. And then I will also, put the attendance link again for everyone if you missed it in the beginning. Um, so just click on the very large link that was just placed in the chat if you want to be recorded um, for attendance today. Um, while we are waiting for the questions to come in, I did have one question um, yep. for Nikki just to kind of get things started. Um, so obviously like in the last 24 hours, like you said, um, Pfizer's vaccine was um, approved for emergency use authorization by the UK. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think is like going to happen next from here? Like, do you think other countries are also going to um, approve the same vaccine, or do you think there's a different one that could maybe um, be more of promise that would kind of be approved sooner? Do you think? Mm. That's a very good question. I think every country uh, is entitled to their own regulatory process. I guess I can't speak for everyone. Uh, I can only think more rational. Uh, point of view. For example, in Singapore, they are they have set up a committee of 14 uh, experts and they will look at all types of uh, data, uh, vaccine data and decide which one is going to be more appropriate. Um, I do want to point out though, one thing is, even though we see a lot of uh, press talking about vaccines is 95% effective, 100% effective, like Wait a minute, like what do they mean the effective means? Okay, um, does it mean is it just neutralizing antibody? Is it T cells response? Okay, are we talking about how long this uh, immunity can uh, last? Is it for six months? Is it for one year? So those are things that I hope the regulators are also taking into consideration. Um, Perhaps, yes, uh, other countries might follow suit. Um, whichever one that gets uh, approved, I think is good. Okay. Logistics kind of things about freezer and things like that. It's just an obstacle or just a challenge that we need to overcome. I guess the most important point is really to get the vaccine out. Uh, which one is better? I think it's, again, um, depending on uh, everyone. If you ask me though, I probably would want to go with something that is a more established vaccine uh, platform, such as the inactivated ones, okay, just because it's uh, relatively cheap to manufacture in a way. It's an established um, way to manufacture, an established way of distribution. Um, why not? Okay. Um, but yeah, it really depends. Uh, for example, even though I said uh, I can't remember which one. I think it's the Sinovac ones. Um, 
it's also going to be used, uh, has been trialed a lot in Indonesia. So perhaps in that country, they might prefer to approve the inactivated uh, vaccine instead. So still going back to the safety and efficacy, which one is um, reliable. Okay. Uh, for some country, cost could be an issue, so they might want to take that into consideration. Um, you know, with too many freezers, they it kind of still adds on to the cost in a way. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Uh, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat at any time. Uh, we do have just a few more minutes um, before the session ends. Maybe another, another point for me to make, uh, I think it's good to have so many vaccine candidates out there and uh, and I hope there will be more uh, vaccines that are being uh, approved or used um, because as we saw just now, different vaccines do have different advantages and disadvantages. Um, so hopefully we do get different a variety. So uh, we did have a question from yep. Justin. Um, he sent it to me privately, which is why I didn't show up in the chat, but um, he wanted to know about the best way to persuade a family member to get the vaccination if they're scared. Um, like, so do you think like there's good reason for people to be scared? And what do you think are like some ways that we can mm. um, address that when we're talking to our family mm -hmm. or our patients? Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, that's a very good question. Um, Remember, I talk about education as well. So I believe, or at least that's how I would, I, I would look at it, is, you know, if we can get enough evidence to, to say that these vaccines are really safe, okay, then we can try to address that. Um, what's quite worrying nowadays is because there is a lot of social media, there's a different sort of, um, I would say, conspiracy theory kind of out there. So it's... It is something very important for us to address. So you just have to slowly kind of say that, look, there are enough evidence that you know, these are safe. We already trialed this on 50,000 uh, candidates or something like that. Um, and if you look at in the past, the other vaccines, the ADR rates are actually very low. We're talking about maybe one or two cases out of a million. Okay, so mild ADR is definitely cannot be avoided. Okay, so injection pains and uh, fever and things like that because that's how vaccine works. It needs our body to kind of know that this is an infection and let's trigger an immune response and therefore this. Um, another part is really we need a lot more research. Okay, so that we can publish data to support us when we try to talk to our, our family or patients and say, look, um, things like, you know, remember I talked about ADE, antibody uh, dependent enhancement effect. So that was observed in the dengue vaccine. So now we know about this thing and it's not something new. It has happened in the past for other vaccines as well. And with that, the vaccine developers and the regulators are aware and they're keeping a close eye on this kind of thing. So, so I guess the best thing is do a lot of education, a lot of persuading. I can't say what works for everyone. So yeah, it's just um, a few weeks ago, I was watching some documentary like uh, there were actually uh, reporters were interviewing what about the vaccine uh, volunteers so those who actually enroll in trials why do they do that some of them did it because they have other vulnerable members in the family so they were doing it not for themselves it's also to protect other members in their home so it could be an angle we can consider but just try to be mild, it's not fear-mongering, yeah. 
Thank you so much. Um, any last questions? I do have another question um, yep. for you. Um, so you went through like some of the different roles that you could see pharmacists taking um, mm -hmm. like before and after this whole process. Um, yep. I guess in your own role, in your own experiences, mm -hmm. what do you see um, your own role being? Um, mm -hmm. Whether it's like as a pharmacist or like in your role at um, MIMS, mm -hmm. um, what do you think you're gonna be most involved in? with regards to this vaccine process? Yeah, for myself, uh, probably about more on the education portion. So I do talk to the, uh, for example, you guys, <laughs> to make sure that, you know, we talk about education, not just educating our own patients. We should also make sure we know the vaccines ourselves, inside out, if possible, as much as possible, so that we can, um, make a more informed decision okay so let's say the uh, uh you know if someone asks me so which vaccine is better so based on what we know so far what are the papers that has been published then uh, we can be more um and make a more educated decision um for myself i actually also look after the team that publishes uh medical information, actually more specifically on the clinical decision support modules. So that's like drug interaction alerts, allergy, and uh, etc. So when COVID-19 started, I got my team together to look at, you know, can we write something about remdesivir? Can we, you know, prepare a monograph? Just even though we know it hasn't been approved yet, but what with what data we have, can we produce something that can benefit the uh, uh, other healthcare professionals? Uh, we also look at making sure our CDS um, alerts are being updated. You know, especially with the spike in uh, hydroxychloroquine use. Uh, you know, trying to make sure every data is updated as much as possible. Yeah. So with the vaccine out now, uh, which is why. I think last month I had also um, did a talk about the COVID vaccine, uh, COVID nineteen vaccine, and I'm also trying to start writing up about the uh, yeah more on the educational part of things because uh, there's just so many um, information out there. How do we curate and actually um, make sure the right people get the right information? Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so with that, it is 6.30 for us, 8.30 for you. <laughs> but again, thank you so much, Nikki, for speaking to us from all the way across the globe. Um, it was an amazing session, and thank you for also answering our questions. Um, and of course, thank you to everyone who came out to the event today. I hope you guys all learned a lot. Um, and again, the session is being recorded, so we'll have the recording afterwards if anyone wants to kind of look back at it or um, someone missed it, but they're interested in learning about it, then they can also view the recording. Um, but that is all we have for today. Our hour is over. Um, so that is the end of our session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me. Of Stay course. safe, guys. It was a pleasure. <laughs> it was great to speak to you, too. All right. Bye. Take care, everyone. Stay safe.